Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> People are waving back. Very nice. Uh, right. So, if you weren't in my talk yesterday, just in case, uh, my name is Peter Rollett. I work for the MSR Network, who are uh, on a piece of work on HE curriculum innovation as part of the Mathematical Sciences strand of the National HE STEM program. Um, yesterday's talk was very interactive, uh, and that was lovely. Today's uh, and a lot of fun, and I expect today's talk to be quite different uh, to that. <laughs> Not fun. Uh, no, no. Um, but I have, I have a few things to show you that, I'm gonna, that people are doing using technology in their teaching uh, that you may or may not find interesting. Uh, and I'm going to try and demo lots of pieces of software all at once. So I think we can expect at least one reboot, surely, uh, <laughs> part way through. Right. Let me get underway. Oh, I, I'm recording this again as yesterday. Um, it seemed to work all right uh, yesterday, so I'm quite pleased. So I'm, I've set it recording again, uh, which is nice. Right, teaching from a tablet PC. Those who were in my talk yesterday will have seen me doing this. Uh, so I have a pen, and with this pen I can write on this screen like this. No, nope, not like that. Oh, what have I done wrong? Oh, that's a marvellous start. Right, pen. Now I feel very strange. I can interact with the screen. Hmm. Well, I have some video of people doing this, even if I can't actually seem to do it myself. Hmm. Try a new note. Yeah. I don't understand what's happened there. <laughs> And there's a lesson in always being prepared and always being well practiced with the technology. I'll, uh, I think I'll say a bit more about that later on. Uh, but uh, so basically, I can write on the screen uh, and draw on the screen and so on and so forth. And um, just not on this one. Hmm. Okay. But I think this is so. Uh, chalk and talk is where you write on a chalkboard and, and everybody copies it down and what have you. Um, there is a tendency for people to move to PowerPoint, uh, which doesn't work very well for mathematics, I would say. Okay, it struggles with the, with the pace. If you ask me something and I don't have a slide for it, then, oh no, what do I do? And, and all sorts of problems like that. But what you can do is you can write on a screen. Now this is interesting because, partly because there are universities which are taking out boards and this is a good alternative. But it has some other advantages. I mean, I can write on this screen and still face you, which means that I'm not speaking into the board, which means that you can hear me clearly. If you're lip reading me, you'll be able to lip read me because I'm facing you. Okay. Um, it's massive. I can write quite small on here, you know, and it's massive on the screen up there. And it could be as big as you like, you know, it's just the limit of the room. So I don't have to stand in the way of it as I'm doing it. I don't know, there are, there are sorts of advantages. There are some other advantages, I would say, uh, which I'll come to now then. An example, I'd be interested to see if this works. Right, this is a PDF. Let's imagine it's made out of LaTeX, which it isn't, because I've discovered that this computer doesn't have LaTeX on it, and frankly, I need to retreat home to my Linux box to make that sort of thing work. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, here's a theorem uh, and with a gap. Now, if I want to get that into Windows Journal, what I do is I click Print, I print to, the program is called Windows Journal. Uh, you print to Journal Note Writer because it considers it a note within Windows Journal. It wants to know a name that it could call it. That's fine. And there it is, it's opened it. So now I can scroll up and down through my many, many pages of notes, right? And when I get to a gap like this, here's the moment of truth. Hey, <laughs> very good. I can draw on it, okay? Uh, and I can write my proof out here, and you can all copy it down into your notes, and everybody's happy. So all the stuff which I would write on the board of the definition of the theorem and boring things like that, which are just writing out, I can put on there already. And then the bits where I want you to watch me do a piece of mathematics, I can write on there live. I think that's quite powerful. Um, yes. It says, attendees at YRM will be interested in a talk on using technology. Corollary, I should give such a talk. That's not a corollary, is it? Someone should give such a talk. <laughs> anyway, right, let me close that. And close that.
close that. Of course, you wouldn't do that live. You would have prepared the note earlier and saved it somewhere. Uh, I'm only doing it live because I want to show you how these things work. Right. Now, there's a guy I know called Joel Feinstein in mathematics at Nottingham um, who does this. Uh, let me show you a video of Joel doing this. This is where I now realize I haven't... An error has occurred. Oh, no, right. Oh, hold on. I'm going to give this one chance to find the internet, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. I prepared this in my room, and I put it to sleep, and I thought when I loaded it up, it would just work. But apparently, YouTube doesn't like that. Edgy Rome, yes. The other thing I didn't test is the sound. I can hear sound, that's good. Oops. Refresh that. Okay. In here, to start at about for each point x, we here's a good point to start. So there's Joel, and we'll come back and do the corollary afterwards. Theorem. Yes, journal for a bit of space. He scrolls up. He gives so here's your page. Uh, proof of the uniform boundless principle. That's proof of 6.1. I think this is slightly easier than the open mapping theorem. We'll set a n to be those x in x with the following property. That for all t in your family... Okay, so interesting or not, maybe not your area, but... So the idea there is what, what the PDF was at the above is what he's handed out as notes. And so basically in lectures, he's going through the notes and adding to them. And so this is a proof that the students will have to write out, or he might give an example that wasn't in the notes to, to add a bit more to the lectures than you're going to get out of the notes. Okay, but I think that's nice, because he doesn't have to go through that boring process of writing out acres and acres of text. Um, but he still gets to do this sort of thing. Right. Trying to labor the point. Um, Okay, now that's interesting. <laughs> so the mouse will write on the page, but the pen won't. But it will write on other PDFs. I don't understand what that is. Anyway, Joel has better ways to annotate PDFs, I should say this. Uh, this program is called Windows Journal. It comes free with Windows on a tablet PC. Um, Joel did use this, and he was using this in that video that I just showed. Uh, but there are other programs that will do this sort of thing that he's um, experimented with and... Uh, he has this blog, uh, Explaining Maths, which has an awful lot of information about using a tablet PC. Okay. The trick is that you have to have one. Okay. <laughs> um, and if you're going to do the recording as well, it has to be quite a high-spec one. Um, so you might find that you start a job and they say, do you want a computer? And you say, yes, please, I'd like a tablet PC. Okay. If they're willing to buy you a computer, it's not going to be much more. Um, the other thing you might find is that you might be lecturing in a room which has one in the room. So a lot of universities now are installing them in lecture theatres by default, uh, things that you can write on, which is very cool. Some are installing interactive whiteboards, which are very interesting. Uh, they're, they're a sort of big screen version. But I don't think they have a lot of advantages over a chalkboard. Because you're in the way of it, it's only this big. It's as, you can't project it very large. If you've got a large class, it's not necessarily going to work very well. Because the big disadvantage of this, of course, is that you can't... Um yeah? So you can't have pages and pages of notes. You can't write notes on that blackboard and then come over to this blackboard and refer to the ones that are over there. So there are issues with it. Of course, what you can do is scroll up and down to the previous bit of the notes if you need to refer to it. So anyway. Now, what Joel does with this is he annotates notes in a way that he thinks the students will annotate their notes and you'll all end up with a nice set of notes at the end of it, and that's good. I would say you can also do things with this technology uh, that are perhaps more interesting. Has anybody ever had to teach or show someone multiplying matrices? A couple of people are nodding. So the way you sort of do this is that you draw out your matrices and then you put a circle around, right? So you, this is where it's not going to work, isn't it? I'm going to try and do it with the, with the pen. So you put a circle around the bit that you want and you put a circle around the other bit that you want and then you draw out over here 
2 times 4 plus 4 times 1. Yeah? And then you go through and you delete what you had, and you go on to the next one. And if you've ever tried to teach that on a board, you end up trying to rub <laughs> characters, and you rub out half of the matrix, and you've got to draw it back in again, and you're going to... This idea of having partially annotated, you know, having part of the stuff already there is very powerful, I think, because you can just rub out what's on top because you've only just written it on. Same with diagrams. Okay, you might put up a, a graph in either sense of the word or some sort of diagram or something, and you can scribble all over it, your notes, point at this bit, point at that bit, and then just rub it all off, and it still looks okay. So rather than just creating a set of notes that's going to look exactly like the final set of notes, what I'm doing there is reusing the same space on the screen, which I think is quite nice. Um, the other thing you can do, by the time you're running a computer and you're writing off it, is that you can use software. Okay, so you're halfway through your lecture and you fire up a computer algebra system if you use Maple or something like that or MATLAB or something like that, or a stats package. You want to fire up Minitab halfway through the class. And I wouldn't suggest that this is something that you lecture the whole time from, but you might just have two minutes in the middle of your lecture where you fire up a bit of software and do something interesting with it, I think. Right, there's a piece of software, software called GeoGebra. Does anybody know GeoGebra 1? One hand has gone out, right. OK, it's very cool. I mean, there are, it's dynamic geometry package. Uh, there are lots of these, GeoGebra just happens to be one of them. I think it's quite well regarded. Here we are. OK, so I'll make that full screen. Now then, it's sort of, you can take the axes off and just draw shapes. But I'm going to draw a graph. You can also, it has a, what it calls a spreadsheet view, where you can put data in and start playing around with data. It's quite a powerful tool. It does different things. Let me show you one thing that it does, or two things, actually, maybe. Let's put my glasses on. So I'm going to write in this bottom box y equals 0.1x cubed, for example. I put the 0.1 to spread it out so I don't have to muck about with the zooming controls, yeah? Because I've done this before. <laughs> right, then. I take a point. I put that point on the line. Now, what this does for me is I can drag that point, and it will stay on the line. Are you with me? So I'm going to put it back down here. Next, I'm going to ask it to draw the tangent of that point on that line. But um, there it is. OK, very nice. And again, I can, as I move the point, it redraws the tangent for me. It keeps the tangent with the point. Uh, then, I think it's this one here, I'm going to ask it for the slope at that point. So that's now the gradient of that line. <coughs> Uh, and what's happening there is uh, going across is one unit and going up is m units. So m is the gradient of this slope. Okay. Now what I'm going to ask you for at the bottom is a new point B, capital B. The coordinates of B are the x part of A and m. So B has the same x coordinate as A and takes as its y coordinate the gradient of the tangent at A. Okay. Enter, there's B just above A. Now, as I move A, if you go back to the slider, I can move A up and down, and B moves with it. Anyone with me? A couple of people are smiling. <laughs> right, I can now right-click on B, I can put trace on. And then as I move A, it's going to trace where B was. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Okay, isn't that lovely? And then, if I want to really label the point, I can enter y equals, what did I put, 0 0.1, so 0.3x squared, and it's right on the trace. Now, I have tried to teach this on a board, and you end up drawing a whole series of diagrams, <laughs> and keep waving your arms about and trying to point out how the top diagram relates to the bottom diagram, and then you draw a, do a dotted line from the top diagram down to show how it relates to the second graph that you've drawn and all this business. And that, I think, is just a lovely bit of intuitive. I mean, it isn't a proof, you know, <laughs> but it's giving you a good, a good understanding of what's going on. OK. Uh, oh, I know. There's another example. This is something that, don't save it, something that somebody showed me quite recently, so I'll, I'll give it a go, but if it doesn't work. Uh, this, you can put these things called sliders on. 
So it's asking me here for the name of my point, which I'm going to call A, the range minus 5 to, point five, uh, to 5, that's absolutely fine. Another one called B, and another one called C. And then I'm going to ask it for a graph that is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So let's put b, oops, uh, I've still got this slider tool open. Let's put b to 0 and c to 0. OK. Now what happens if I move a up and down the slider? Some people are doing this, waving your arms. Yes. OK. So if I move A back and forth, it does this, yeah? Um, whoa, blimey. OK, nobody said that. If I get it to 0, it vanishes. It goes to y equals 0 from below. OK, beans. we get the idea. What happens if I move C? Up and down, up and down, OK. Now then, you can tell what's coming now. What happens if I move B? What does that mean? <laughs> I'm getting all sorts of funny arm movements here. Do you know? Do you feel sure? Do you have an intuitive understanding of how functions work? It's asking me to enroll my fingerprints. OK, let's have a look. Oh, blimey. It's a very weird thing. Now, this graph is, at the moment, because c is 0 and b is 0, this is uh, ax squared. I'm going to ask it to graph minus ax. Oh, dear, I can't type. Minus ax squared, like that. And then as I slide b, it goes up and down. Do you see? So the minimum is going up and down the negative version. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and if I change a, if I make a a bit looser, Still does it, same thing. And if I make a flip over, do the opposite thing, still does it. But how long would that have taken with a pen and paper or with a chalkboard, you know? I just think that's really nice to get a proper understanding of a sort of intuitive feel of how these things are working, what's going on. <laughs> okay. Am I for time? Oh, that's okay. Um, oh, I can close that one. Can I? Right. Screencasting, uh, recording the screen. Okay. Um, I can't show you this because I'm currently doing it. So I can't press record because I'm currently recording. But that's what the recording box looks like. And you may have seen if you were looking at the start, I press the big red button and it gives you a 3, 2, 1 count in. Uh, I'm wearing a, a lapel mic. Um, with a little radio thing in my pocket, which a lot of, actually this lecture theatre has one already. Uh, I think a lot do, plugged into the, the system. Um, and then there's a the receiver box that plugs into my laptop, which I'm going to be a bit careful about throwing around because I might unplug something. Um, and that's that. You can also get involved with webcams, you know, plug in a webcam that would then record you. For example, I could plug in a webcam and sit it on here, and then it could record me, as I was wondering about, which is what Joel does in that video that we saw earlier, he was in the bottom left-hand corner. That gets a bit faffy. I mean, I think it's worth doing for some things. I think it's probably quite engaging to have the speaker in the corner. But if you're expecting your students to watch your lectures, they probably don't need convincing in quite the same way as if you're putting a talk to enthuse school children to come and do mathematics at university, for example. Okay, Because you have to, the reason it's faffy is because you've got more kit to carry around. You've also got to get lighting right. If I put a webcam here and tried to record myself, it would just come out black, so I'd have to put a lamp on myself, and it just gets very hard work. Um, I did this yesterday in the lecture. So for those of you who were here... Right, hi, everybody. You'll recognize this. I think that's ample time. I'm not sure how long this is going to take. It depends how much you speak. Uh, it's got to be said. My name is Peter Rowlett. I, uh, it's a little bit confusing. I work for... Um, the Math Stats and R Network, who are at the bottom of the screen there. Um, sorry, lights down. <laughs> Somebody had helped me put the lights all the way up yesterday. So I work for the Math Stats and R Network. 
on a project in HE Curriculum Innovation in the Mathematical Sciences strand of the National HE STEM program. Okay, so there I am, I'm <laughs> on the screen. If that's not clear. Blah, blah, blah. So last night when I got in, I pushed the make it into a AVI file button and it span away for a couple of minutes and did that and then I pressed the upload to YouTube button and it did that and then when I woke up this morning, there it was. So it's that, it's that quick and easy, you know. Actually, that's a bit of a lie. I also chopped off the end because I forgot to stop the recording and you came and asked me a question and halfway through that I remembered to turn the thing off. <laughs> So I just chopped the end off because that wasn't useful. But it's really easily done. There's a little program, a little timeline, but you don't have to do any of that. You can just, you can just publish it as it is. You know, it's absolutely fine. Um, so I think that's quite a powerful bit of kit. That wasn't what I meant to do. I told you there's too much switching between software going on for this. Right, if you are interested in this sort of thing, hi. Yes. Now, there's a question about whether that's an effective thing to do or not. But yes. Okay. Or, I mean, say, for example, um, if you're teaching a class of 250 people, a good number of them will have dyslexia and may not be able to follow what you're doing in real time. So by offering a recording, they can go back and look at bits that they haven't understood. Or and it depends how much work you want to put in, because I've spoken to people who would try and chop up their lecture into segments so that students could be revising and think, oh, I don't understand this bit, but I really did understand it in the lecture, so I'll go back and watch that 10 minutes. But that's more work for you to chop it up like that, you see. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joel seems to find that they're absolutely fine just finding the lecture and scrolling through to the right point. There's a question about whether that will make attendance drop, which is really, I mean, you, you, there's a question of if you hand out lecture notes, will they not come to lectures? And then there's a sort of follow-on from that, if you hand out an actual recording of the lecture. Uh, and then it's very difficult, that question, because... Really, you want them to come so that they can contribute and ask questions if they don't understand something. But if it's 9 o'clock on a Friday morning, they might not decide to do that. And there's an issue with, um, if you hand out notes, students, a lot of students tend to put the notes in a folder and consider that done. And then I'll revise it at the time. But that's not revision, that's looking at it for the first time. With this, oh, I haven't quite watched this week's lecture, but I'll, I'll, I'll get round to it. And you get to the point where you're a couple of days away from the exam and you no longer have enough time to watch 20 weeks of lectures. <laughs> you know, it, it, it can be quite, I mean, it's an interesting area that, whether it's useful or not. Um, mm. But it's sort of easily done. The other thing that's good for is things like outreach talks and things like that. You can stick a video on YouTube and say, come and study at my university or whatever it is, you know. So. But you don't have to screen record in order to do the tablets. I, you can send them as separate things. But Joel's very keen on both of these. Actually, the other thing Joel does, which I should have said, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, is um, he records his lectures and they go on Nottingham have an, what's called an open educational resources site, uh, which is educational resources that are free, lies in sort of free for you to use. Well, they're sort of, they're Creative Commons license, if you know what that means, which I'm struggling to explain. Um, so you might find that somebody in a university halfway around the world doesn't know how to teach a topic necessarily, uh, and maybe they'll give Joel's recording instead of doing that. So that's, that's a sort of another area you might do. Anyway, so John's very keen on this. Now he's running, we were having emails back and forth today trying to get some dates organized for this, uh, but he's running, gonna run a workshop four times. I'm being quite careful about how I say that. It isn't, it isn't four different workshops. It's, the, it's an introduction to uh, tablet PCs and screencasting and that sort of thing uh, at Nottingham and we're partially funding that in order to make it available to people outside of the university in, in mathematics particularly. Um, two dates provisionally so far, 27th of May and 22nd of June, there will be four in the end. Uh, so if you're interested in this sort of thing, you might come along to something like that. Okay. Ah, next slide, online video. So OER means Open Educational Resources, uh, which I've just spoken about. Uh, the other thing uh, that we're doing in this area is we funded a guy called Trevor Hawkes um, to do a project called the Internet Librarian and Curator for Mathematics Videos. Uh, so <laughs> the, the sort of, the theory here is that there are loads of teaching resources online and particularly loads of videos online of people trying to teach. And the question is, are they any good? Are they, how are they quality controlled and things like that? So Trevor is looking at, this is a proof of concept pilot um, he wants to create an online portal giving searchable access to a selection of, of recommended, of sort of vetted 
mathematics video tutorials. So he isn't making video tutorials. He's looking at what's out there and seeing if it's any good or not, uh, which is a nice idea, I think. OK, e-assessment. I almost took this out because it sort of doesn't quite flow with the rest of it. But so far, it's been teaching. This is now assessment. Um, we're funding a piece of work on a, on a, there's a suite called Mathletics, which a guy uh, called Martin Greenhow at Brunel. Um, I have put his name on there, that's good. Um, Martin at, at Brunel has developed this over a period of years, and we're funding a project called Development and Inter Integration of Computer-Aided Assessment in, of Discrete Mathematics, which is a particular piece of work that he wants to do. At the moment, you have to have a particular piece of software which your university has to buy in order to run this, and Martin's looking at opening this up so you don't need that piece of software, essentially. But let me show you, if I can, very briefly. Um, this is on Martin's website, and it's quite old, I think. The dates of the files are sort of 2008. Um, but I just thought it might be useful to give you an idea. Um, pick a number from 1 to 4, I don't know. <laughs> 2, 1 to 5. Oh, okay, that's good. You can do colors and fonts, and I told the font to be bigger earlier, and it seems to have remembered that, so that's, that's nice. Um, never read the agreement, right? I agree. No? <laughs> um, okay, so here's, here's an example question. Now, in this case, oh, certainly when it's running in the real software, I don't know, the, all these numbers will change, and often the scenario will change, or the units will change, or the names of the people involved will change, or whatever. So it's got a certain amount of randomization. Um, so it's telling you some numbers, and you have to give an answer to two decimal places. I reckon it's definitely that. Okay. <laughs> and I'm wrong. What a shame. Um, but I can get a hint from this. That's being a bit slow. Um, it'll give me a hint, or I can ask it for a solution. And Ma I think Martin finds that, well, I've seen, when I've seen him talk about this, Oh. <laughs> uh, when it works with the real piece of software, anyway. Um, a lot of students will go in, and the first time through, they'll just put no answer just to get the feedback, because it's so useful to then learn what's going on. So, but this is, this is a sort of, there are lots of different types of computer-aided assessment system, um, and this happens to be one of them. Now, this is, are you sure you want to finish? Yes, I am sure. Um, which is what this next bit says. There is a project, now this is slightly complicated, it is funded by the National HE STEM program, but not by my part of the National HE STEM program, if that makes sense, uh, called E-Assessment in Maths and Stats. It's, the project leader is uh, Bill Foster at Newcastle. Um, paraphrasing the description of the project you can find on the web, uh, E-Assessment in Maths and Stats has reached a point where a diverse wealth of experience needs to be consolidated, shared, and jointly reflected upon by the community. So we went, they ran a day and I went along to it and a whole lot of people stood up and gave their presentation about their computer uh, um, assessment system. And a lot of them were tackling the same issues and generally solving them in very similar ways. But because there's not much talking to each other, a lot of people are starting from step one. You know. so, so they're trying to work on, on that as a, a sort of sharing opportunity beyond, around the community and trying to get people together so that not everybody has to keep reinventing the wheel, I suppose. Anyway, that's the bit about assessment. Um, web conferencing. I wasn't quite sure what to call this bit. Web conferencing and more is what I've gone with. Uh, there's a project Alan Owen at Loughborough is running called a pilot for a shared online statistics advisory service. There's this piece of software called Illuminate, which to call it web conferencing is not quite doing it justice, I think. It describes itself, I think, as a virtual classroom. And we talked about calling it a virtual learning. Oh, no, hold on a minute. That sounds like you're putting lecture notes on the web. That's not it. But it's a, it's a real-time communication thing, so you both log in. I'll show you in a second. Um, Alan's basic idea is that there are, there are people who need help with their statistics, particularly final year students, PhD students in other disciplines, um, who might, if the university offered one, go along to a stats drop-in support center. But Maybe your university doesn't offer one, but maybe you can have a dial you know, f um, web conferencing link to a university who does, who can then offer appointments. So that's what they're trying out. They're trying to work out the, the issues in running such a thing and whether there's a demand for such a thing. I'll show you this video. Um, so what this is, this is um, something that 
a friend and I tried with a couple of people who were willing volunteers uh, of doing a puzzle through this to test how the interaction worked between the speaker and the audience. Um, the puzzle, I don't know if you know this sort of puzzle, is a river crossing puzzle where um, in this case, it's a very simple version. A farmer has bought a fox, a goose, and a bag of beans. I'm supposed to ask why a farmer is buying a fox. Right, okay. uh, a, a farmer has bought a fox, a goose, and a bag of beans. He comes to a river. The boat will only hold him and one of his purchasers, and he must get them all to the other side. If left alone, the fox will eat the goose, and the goose will eat the bag of beans. So how does he do it? Can I make this loud? I think I can make this loud. I'm supposed to ask why a farmer is buying a fox. I don't think. Um, so here we are, here's the river. Um, if I define some notation, let's have a fox, a goose, and a bag of beans. Uh, there's a boat on this side with the farmer in it. There you go. So, by responding in the chat window, uh, which animal do you want to take, or which product do you want to take across the river first? So we did two things here. First of all, I asked people to talk into the chat window on the left-hand side. And then another thing that we tried later on was an actual vote, where I gave three options and they got a little multiple choice thing. I have a helper on this um, who's, who's moderating the session, who's looking at the chat window so that I don't have to, basically. Uh, and I think he'll speak in a second. You can see in the top left there are four people logged in. Okay. In the chat um, Stephen was going to read the chat window to me in case there were lots of things flying by, but there aren't. Uh, so there's only two of you. Vicky says Fox. Christian says I should map A to Fox, B to Goose. Uh, that's presumably for voting, is it? I'm going to do that in a second, but we're, I'm trying to try out the different ways of, of you communicating with me. So I'll take the Fox across, get rid of the boat, and move the Fox onto the other side. So then the farmer's over here, and the Goose eats the bag of beans. Okay, so uh, that hasn't worked. So let's move it back. Now, if we took across the beans, then the fox would eat the goose, so that wouldn't work either. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so in fact, we have to take the goose, because that leaves a combination that, that works. So the goose is now over here. There's no point in the farmer taking the goose back again. So he comes back alone. Uh, so now, which one should he take over? The fox or the beans? Christian says fox. OK, very good. So we'll take the, uh, the fox over with the farmer. Now, the farmer is supervising them, so they don't eat each other. Um, but if he leaves to go back to the other side, the fox is going to eat the goose. Uh, so what do we do? Vicky says, take the goose. Very good. Oops, sir. So the goose comes back. Now, there's no point in taking the goose back again. We were just in that situation. So we'll take the, uh, the bag of beans across and then come back. Uh, so he's over here, and then come back, pick up the goose, and everybody's got across happy, and he can carry along his way. Uh, very good. So Ta-da. Right. <laughs> so there you are. So I don't, I mean, that's a slightly trivial example, but I think you sort of get the idea. There, was a, there were participants. They can stick their hand up or put their thumbs down if they don't understand it. They can chat in the chat window. And like I say, you can give them options for three, four, five multiple choice, so you can ask them. Uh, we did a slightly more advanced version of this, and I, I gave at each point three or four options, and they were able to vote on which option they liked. And that's a, so it's kind of interesting. It also does some very basic things. You could just do, you know, literally sharing a whiteboard and and uh, working through a problem. Um, you can you can often you can release the control to either end um, uh, on a shared whiteboard so that. Uh, you can say to the student, work through the problem, and I'll tell you where you've gone wrong, or vice versa. You can show them what you're doing uh, from your end. So there you are. I think that's an interesting piece of technology. Uh, again, uh, we're running a workshop on this. So Alan's project, I've asked him, um, as well as doing this project for us, to run a workshop providing a mathematics and statistics support service using Illuminate, a virtual learning and teach teaching learning environment. You can see we struggled over what to call it. Uh, I still don't think we quite got it right, but anyway. Uh, Lovebury University, 30th of June, 2011. Um, 
the point about these workshops, really, what I'm trying to get, the, particularly this one to do, a lot of workshops, you go along and listen to six people share how they've done something, and then you go home again, and that's that. And what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to get, in this case, we're going to have three people in the morning tell you how they've used this in their teaching, either in one-to-one -one supports, small tutorial, things like that. Uh, and then in the afternoon, he's going to show you actually how to use the software and how to get, get going with it. So the idea is that you're not only learning how to do the thing, but you're also empowered to do the thing. So you, you might think that's interesting. I mean, actually, that piece of software might be quite good just if you're collaborating with someone far away, you know, or, or maybe not that far away, I don't know. But if you're, if you're working with someone on a paper or something like that, it can be quite interesting. Right. Interaction. So like I said, yesterday's talk, when I asked questions, you spoke back. This is very unusual for a mathematics lecture theatre. Okay. Um, what I didn't ask anyone to do uh, was if anyone uses Twitter. I've seen people do things with text messaging, um, where they, they have a piece of software on here that collects text messages from the students, so the students can ask questions that way. The advantage of this is that you don't have to put your hand up and say something stupid. Okay. Another way of doing this for free is Twitter. Of course, there's a website... There are probably lots, but there's a website called twitterfall.com. If I put in here, oh, it's already remembered it, uh, YRM2011, uh, and then I put it into presentation mode, OK? So I could be giving my lecture and every now and again check this and just check that uh, the students have understood what's going on. Most of these are me, it's got to be said. <laughs> and they're not in order. I don't know why. It's not quite... Uh, it's not quite reverse order, it's not quite in order. But when, it, when it's loaded all the queued ones, it'll get them out of its system, and then when new ones appear, they'll, they'll appear at the top of the screen. And I've been to conferences where they've had something like this running in the corner, uh, and every now and again someone will tweet something. And, I don't know. It's just an interesting idea, but you don't, have to be, you don't have to point out who you are. You can just do this anonymously, your students. Uh, and like I say, there are text messaging programs that will do similar things. Right. Another way of getting interaction, uh, there's this thing called a response system. Does anyone know? Or electronic voting system. Do you know what this is? You get a little box. So the middle picture there is the little box, or several of them in a row. Uh, it has numbers from 0 to 9 on them. And basically, you have a little dongle that plugs into your computer, and the students all get one of these, and they press the option they like, and it talks to the dongle. Okay. <laughs> it's a plug-in to PowerPoint. There's also a plug-in that just, just works without PowerPoint, so you don't have to use PowerPoint. Uh, to do it. Um, on the left hand side there is the results of one of the votes uh, and on the right hand side is um, some notes this guy's written up. So um, this is somebody else who uses a tablet PC, somebody else at Nottingham actually. Um, so on the left hand side he's written out a question, he's given them an, a sheet with the question on and then they've answered it. They have voted on their answer and you can see I hope that most people have gone for C, option C on that uh, which is you know, this over here. Um, over here, this is the, on the right-hand side, is the work solution for that question, or for a question. I can't remember. No, for that question, I think. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about why he was using this. He was interested in whether the students were looking at their lecture notes during the term or whether they were saving them all for the end. Okay. <laughs> um, so what he decided to do about this was to have an optional quiz in an examples class every fortnight. And basically he said, read, read the notes and there'll be a quiz on the content that's in them every couple of weeks. And he hoped that this would just encourage them to, to sort of get going and read the notes. Um, what are the existing options? Why did we decide to use this technology? Well, what he'd been doing, I mean, basically you could do it by a show of hands, which is awful. <laughs> so what he'd been doing was he'd been handing out, do you know what optical mark reader? This is these things where you scribble out the circle that relates to your answer and then it's machine read. So you'd hand these out and people would write down their answers and hand them back in again. But he also wanted to give them feedback in the class on, on what happened. So he also asked for a show of hands. The problem with a show of hands is if you look at this example on the previous page, so option A, about 1% went for option A. About, ooh, I don't know, 6% or something went for option B. And then everybody went for option C. Now, I would say that the people who wanted to choose A and B, when nobody else, but this is a room with 100 students in it, when no one else puts their hand up, 
you might keep quiet about that. And then these few people who were going to put option D, about 4% of the class, four people in 100, when everyone else put their hand up for C, your hand would have gone up as well, let's face it. So you aren't really capturing. Now, it's not very, I've chosen that example because it's very marked. There are some where he's got two thirds who've gone for option C and one third have gone for option D. And again, I'd say if two thirds of the class put their hand up, you might be more tempted to put yours up as well. And then he might not realize that actually a big chunk of the class has got some misconception about this question. So it's an interesting piece of data. But um, yeah, so he was collecting it that way. The other thing about, uh, the, with the optical mark sheets is that he never, he never collected in as many as he handed out because students didn't want, to, didn't want to hand it back. They've already done their voting by putting their hands up, so they're happy. Um, and also, it takes a week to get the results back and so forth. So, uh, so there we go. Um, so I don't think those are very good options. He's doing a double count, and it's slow, and it's inefficient. It's not really capturing what he wants to. So we decided to do this. Does it work? It's thought to work. Constructivist is a note for me there. The idea is that by... Well, basically, if you put your hand up in a massive group and the lecturer says something and that's that, with this, you're choosing an option, and then the lecturer will say, those of you who chose option C, here's what I think you did wrong and why. So even though you might be in a class with 300 people in it, you're still getting individual feedback from your response that you've given. And then the other thing that people try and do with this sort of technology, which apparently does work very well, is you ask them to vote, they all vote, they get a higgledy-piggledy set of answers, and then you say, talk to the person next to you and see if you can convince them that you're right. Okay? And you would hope that those who are right would be able to convince those who are wrong. And then you take the vote again, and it usually converges on the correct answer. Now, that's good, because instead of you saying, no, you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong, actually, they've talked it through with the person next to them, and they've, this is why it's constructive. They've constructed their own understanding of why that was wrong, or why they were wrong, and why this answer's right, usually. So that's the sort of idea. Anyway. Many published studies, you see, um, evaluate it based on student and staff perceptions of it. They seem to like it. Okay, the lecturer in this case, I said, are you going to do it again next year? He said, oh, they seem to like it. I think I will. Okay. So, we tried to do a bit of evaluation. <laughs> my warning is, how do I know it's working? How do I know it's worth my effort? This is a, an extra thing that he's doing in his lessons. How does he know it's worth his effort? And how do I know it isn't doing damage? It could be worse. OK? So did it work? It's difficult to evaluate by looking at marks, because the marks for this module go up and down like all sorts every year. So just saying the marks went up 10% is no indication of anything. So what we did was we did an evaluation with the students on what they said they did with the feedback and some other questions about how they use the system, which is not great, but it's, it's sort of interesting to try and collect, I think. I'm not going to go into the details here uh, because of time, but basically, um, so there were students who, we asked them whether they thought about their answers before they answered or whether they just guessed. And we, the ones who said that they thought about the answers before answering, we then, asked them, we then asked them all, if they knew the answer and were correct, what did they do? If they knew the answer and were incorrect, what did they do? And if they didn't know the answer, if they guessed it, and were correct and were incorrect. So the students who reported that they thought about the answer carefully before answering it, if they were correct and they knew the answer, they were very pleased with themselves. And otherwise, they went away and found out why they were wrong. So they looked at the work solution for that question, usually. Now, the students who reported that they didn't think carefully about the answer before answering, if they got it right, they felt happy with themselves, regardless of whether they had guessed or not. Okay? And if they got it wrong, they either did nothing, or the most they really did was talk to their friends about why it was wrong. So this is interesting to me. I would say the students who think carefully about the answer, you might think are the more conscientious students. Perhaps they're the students who would go and look at the lecture notes anyway, which was the original problem he was trying to solve. And now they've got this question wrong, so they're going and looking at the work solutions for that question. So actually you're potentially overloading those students by giving them extra things to do. But the students who don't think carefully about it, who just guess and whatever and doesn't matter, are then not doing anything about it. So you're either overloading your more conscientious students or you're widening the gap between them because some of them are getting extra tuition that the others aren't. And I don't know, it's just a, a mess of a thing, really. Is, is it really working for them or not? It's very hard to, 
hard to say, and it, it's a, you know, it's a opinion sur a survey based on their opinion of what's going on. So it's, it's difficult to say, but I think that's interesting, just to try and look at it a little bit beyond, did they like it or not? Is it actually worth doing? And I think it can be worth doing, and what I wish you would do is this thing of getting them to discuss the question between themselves and then answer it again, because I think that really could that really could help. Particularly if you can get the students, because you, you'll notice those who didn't really do much about it if they got it wrong, they would at least talk to their friends about it. They wouldn't go and look at the notes necessarily. So if you can get them talking, particularly if you can get the students who are doing very well talking to those who aren't doing very well, that's, that's potentially very useful, I would say. Where are we now then? Did it work? I think there are two decent problems with using technology. That last example was meant to serve as a sort of cautionary tale, really. There are people who don't use technology because they don't know how to use it. Or just because they don't feel very confident because something like what happened at the start where it wouldn't write on the thing might happen and then I'll look like an idiot in front of my students. Okay, this is a function of me not having used it very much, I'll be honest with you. So Joel, who does this, he does whatever he does, four, six lectures a week, whatever, and he gets very used to it and it's very, he's very confident with it. And I use it only for odd examples like this where I'm showing it off to people <laughs> and it tends to go a little bit wrong. Um, I would urge you to learn how to use it. If you don't feel confident, try and get confident. There are some really powerful things that technology can do and I hope I've shown you some of those today. But on the other, side, on the other hand, there are people who overuse it, people who are just enthusiastic about the technology and use it for everything. And in that case, I would say, Consider why you might need it. So in the case of that electronic voting system, it was that we, we want to do this thing. We want to do this quiz because we have a good, sound educational reason for doing it. And the offline solution doesn't really work very well, so we're going to use technology. And I'd say it's that sort of thing. You need to go through that process of thinking, why am I using this? What is the educational need? What is the non-technology alternative? And why doesn't it work? And then once you have used it, do a proper evaluation. And I'm not interested in whether it's publishable in an educational research journal, but just if I'm going to bother to do this again next year, has it actually worked? I think those are good questions to ask. Um, that might be the end. It is the end. There's me and my stall. <laughs> That's a sign, the sign that it's almost over. Um, so I hope I've shown you a few, a few interesting things and got you interested in that sort of thing. And maybe when you start, if you start lecturing, you know, you'll be, uh, you'll be aware of some of the things that are going on. Maybe you want to come to a couple of the workshops and, and have a think about it. Uh, I should say I, my project hasn't published anything on technology yet, although it certainly will. It's a very fruitful area for um, innovation in the curriculum. But what I've got at the front is some of the MSOR network, my employer's publications. Um, they, run, they publish a <coughs> termly journal. Um, I suppose I'd say practitioner journal. It sometimes gets called newsletter, but that undersells it, I think. Uh, and one of those is on flexible learning, and a lot of that is through technology. The other one is on excellent teaching. What makes a good lecture? Things like that. I should have mentioned that yesterday. Um, and there's still a couple of the graduate skills brochure and the HE STEM newsletter as well. Uh, I have my stall. I'm still going to be here. I'm coming to dinner tonight, and I'm going to be in coffee tomorrow morning. So if you have any, anything you want to ask me, then uh, do come and see me. Although my stall looks a lot more bare than it does in this picture. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs> There's a little bit in the corner of the screen where if you hover on it, it shows you the desktop, which is not always useful. Um, thank you very much. So there's me, Twitter name, email address, and web address. The web address is where you can find information of all these workshops and things like that. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. <laughs>